Hello class and welcome to your module on public opinion as analyzed by Bernstein. So in this uh, video we're going to go through a lot of slides. This is slide heavy. So uh, grab a beverage, buckle up, and let's dive in. All right, so we're talking today about Bernstein. 2014, not 2104, chapter three, which is on public opinion. And it's asking the question, what is the relationship between public opinion and public policy? And Burstein's looking at some really novel and critical data to think about sampling bias. Okay, so here is our agenda for uh, not only this video, but also for class on Thursday. Now, in this video, we will begin with thinking about the should and the is. And this is thinking about what is the influence of public policy? What should it be and what is it? How strong is it? And how does this all relate to democratic concerns? To concerns about the nature and the effectiveness, how well democracy is doing in the United States. We'll then shift uh, attention to the problems. And then, and then again, we're, we're gonna talk about what we've also talked about in class on Tuesday related to reviewing the limitations of past research. And then we'll talk about Bernstein's approach uh, and to how he's going to collect data on his own and then think about how he replicates past research on public opinion in order to really get to the bottom of the question, how much does sampling bias matter? That will end the video for today, but then we'll continue talking about replication on Thursday and also then shift to talking about takeaways, right? How sometimes, for instance, public opinion doesn't really even exist at all. And what does that mean about American democracy? And uh, what are the broader takeaways about how, what we can understand about how sometimes public opinion does influence public policy and how sometimes it doesn't? And what does this all mean? So we'll go in towards, uh, you know, the kind of bigger, broader question on Thursday during our Zoom class. All right, so first things first, the should and the is. Now, what is Burstein talking about with this? Well, what he's talking about is that almost everyone agrees that in a democracy, public policy should be strongly affected by public opinion, right? This is what should be, because this is what should reflect um, real democratic outcomes. But there is actually a lot of disagreement about how strong the effect of public policy is. While there's consensus that public policy, um, you know, within the research, there is consistent results that show an influence of public policy. The degree to which this is a strong effect is contentious. There's disagreement about it because um, many critics will say that uh, studies showing a strong effect might suffer from selection bias, right? Because polling tends to focus on issues that are already important to the public. Now, more specifically, critics of the strong effect view claim that if surveys act asked about less important issues, studies would find opinion to have less of an impact on public policy. And what does this mean? Well, if opinion does have actually less of an impact, then these critics argue that democratic institutions must not really work as well as we think they do. Now, the claim that a weak link between public opinion and public policy means that democratic institutions are not functioning well rests on two key assumptions. Now, the first is that um, public opinion has meaningful views on less important issues, right? So this is thinking about how uh, even when um, we don't necessarily poll on these issues of, from public opinion about like ones that people are not gathering that much support, if the public was asked about these, uh, you know, low salient issues, they'd have strong opinions about them. And the second is that uh, politics is a zero-sum game, that either the public gets what it wants or special interests get what they want, right? So uh, this is thinking about dem democracy. And if uh, the public isn't really being consulted on issues that they do care about based on this first assumption, um, and when they're not being consulted, in fact, it's going to be special interests that are consulted at, you know, at a cost to public through uh, this lack of participation in public opinion. Now let's review some of the problems here, reviewing the issues with prior research. Now, re research is very limited um, in terms of uh, what 
questions are asked by pollers, right? Because when polls ask only general attitudes on issues, like how do you feel about the environment? Um, we can examine whether the public wants government to do something about this broad issue and then measure when government did something at all, right? So we can measure when changes in, uh, you know, the importance of particular issues matter to the public, how that reflects changes in government, whether, uh, you know, public policy is or is not passed. But what we can't do is examine how action on a particular policy proposal was affected by public opinion about those proposals, right? We can't really speak to how public opinion is shaping the content of any given policy proposal. Um, and so some research that tries to do this in a kind of broader way is thinking about, for instance, was the Vietnam War a mistake? Um, do uh, blacks have a good chance to get jobs as white? Do they have as good of a chance? Or, um, and in thinking about this, they ask broader questions about policy moods. How important are these issues to you? Do you think that, for instance, uh, um, discrimination against blacks in America is a serious issue. And based on answers to that question, we can think about uh, policies related to if um, blacks have a good as, as good of a chance as whites to get jobs. And so this is the kind of approach that have, has been taken in the past. But researchers are still concerned, right? They're concerned about the problems with poll wording. And so what they started to do actually was they began collecting data on more specific policy proposals. And these researchers usually still found a strong connection between public opinion and policy. But it's uh, still you know, generally asked about issues that are very important to the public, right? We still have this potential sampling bias problem. Um, and examples of research on this are abortion, campaign contributions, and sex, same sex marriage. Okay, so the critics are pretty well in agreement that sampling bias should be a big deal. But is it a big deal? How big of a deal is this? How much is, how much is sampling bias uh, altering the way we're measuring the impact and influence of public opinion on policy. How much are we overestimating things? How big of a deal is this sampling bias? Well, Bernstein's going to go ahead and try to find out. And in doing so, he's going to collect as much data as he can on public opinion itself on different issues, on the issues that he's already collected data on for policy proposals. So here's how Burstein approaches collecting this data, um, as opposed to you know past critics, which we've seen in their approach. Um, what Burstein is going to do instead is look at uh, reputable um, polling data already, right? And look at polling questions of three types and collect all of that data uh, and put it together. So the first is a specific issue preference. And this is polling questions that address a topic clear, like very clearly um, related to the policy proposal. And um, an example is, should the U.S. take the lead in addressing climate change? And uh, what, what that example question would uh, align with is the example proposal uh, to reduce greenhouse gases. Now, these questions still aren't specific policy proposals exactly, but they are the best available. He then looks at general issue preference. And this is thinking about questions that relate to a policy's proposal's issue domain, but not to the exact policy itself. So an example question would be, should the U.S. government spend more on health care? And uh, this would relate to an example proposal to provide more health information and counseling to Medicare recipients, right? And now finally, there is issue importance. And so this is thinking about what do you think is the most important problem facing this country? That's the polling question uh, that this is thinking about. And so this question is asked often. And um, if uh, he, he collected the responses to that question and uh, categorized the issue as salient if at least 1% of respondents chose it and saw how this aligned with the policy proposals he had in hand in his own data set. Okay, so here are some critical descriptive statistics based on the polling data and thus the uh, information, the data on public opinion that uh, Burstein was able to collect. So he was able to find specific issue preference for 10 of the proposals included in his um, data set of policy proposals, and that represents 17%. 
In addition, he was also able to find general issue preference data available for another 26 of the policy proposals in his data set. So that's an additional 43%. So then at the, right there, he has some kind of issue polling uh, available for a total of 60% of the proposals in his sample. Now, policy mood is relevant for proposals that can be classified as liberal or conservative, which is another 12 proposals or 20%, right? So he can, has issue importance on data on those as well. But there, were, there are no measures of public opinion at all on 12 of the proposals in his sample, which is 20% uh, of the proposals. Now, this all chalks up to the fact that um, some sort of preference data is available for 24 of the 26 proposals that are classified as salient, right? So that's 92%. He's got preference data on 92% of proposals given that they are categorized as salient. But what about for the non-salient proposals? Well, then he only has preference data available for 12 of the 34. That's 35%. And so this disconnect, right, the fact that there's preference data available for, uh, you know, 92% of salient proposals, but only 35% of non-salient proposal starts to already support claims that there is sampling bias. Otherwise, there wouldn't be such a stark difference. Okay, so what now, right? Because Bernstein has this data. Descriptively, it's definitely starting to tell a story where so, uh, selection bias and sampling bias might be somewhat substantial. But how do we know, right? How is he going to test the degree to which sampling bias is altering and uh, you know, overestimating the results of past research? Well, what he's going to do is he's going to use replication and he's going to kind of, as best he can, rerun past research analyses to see how much uh, sampling bias is impacting the results. And so uh, let's dive into the first one and uh, see what he finds. Okay, so we're heading to the third section here, um, replication, as just described. And if you hear noises in the back, that's just Harry in my office wreaking havoc. It's okay. Okay, so the first uh, study that Burstein is trying to replicate is that of Monroe's. And Monroe did a cross-sectional analysis where he's analyzing the relationship between public opinion and public policy between 1980 and 1993. And he's doing this by finding 566 survey questions on potential federal policies and then figuring out whether a majority of those with opinions wanted policy change, didn't want policy change, and then seeing did policy change or not, right? So he's measuring consistency here, right? And consistency is measured by if the public prefers the status quo and the policy remains unchanged, then, you know, that's consistent. Or on the flip side, if the public prefers change and change happens, right? That is, again, consistent. So this is trying to measure the, um, you know, impact of uh, public opinion. Now, in Burstein's analysis, he measures consistency based on if the majority of the public favors the policy proposal and it's enacted, that's consistent, or on the flip side, if the majority of the public is opposed to the proposal and it is subsequently not enacted, that is also consistent. So let's check out his results. So here's a table. Don't freak out. Um, let's look at it step by step. So this up up top here, this is what um, Monroe finds. Now on the left hand side here, we have the policy outcome. We have this if the policy uh, remained the same, if no change happened, if the status quo prevailed, or if there was a change. And uh, just uh, indicates it represents the number of cases, number of policies in his sample. And then consistency is the degree to which, uh, you know, whether it's change or status quo, how much there is alignment, right? This measure of consistency that we just discussed. Now, if we look up here at the 70%, this means that 70% of the time, the public wanted no change and no change occurred. Now, he sees a much stronger influence here for public opinion than, for instance, over uh, uh, here in the change section, where when the, pub when the public wanted change, change occurred 
45% of the time, right? And 55% 50, of the time, it remained the same. Um, so there's not too strong of uh, influence of public opinion here, but nonetheless, there's consistency 55% of the time. Now let's look at uh, Bernstein's um, results, but only with proposals with the opinion data. Okay, so this is for all of the proposals that do either have uh, public opinion data in terms of whether the public favors it or opposes it. And so what we see here again on the left hand side, we see, pop, we see proposals enacted and proposals not enacted. And uh, when it comes to, for instance, so, so uh, Bernstein finds kind of like the opposite of what Monroe finds here, because if we look down here um, with respect to the majority of the preferences oppose the proposal, we see that 86% of the time the proposal is not enacted, right? As opposed to um, favoring the proposal when the public favors proposal is enacted 41% of the time. Nonetheless, consistency wise, right, based on Burstein's measure of consistency, he finds consistency 50% of the time, which is similar to uh, Monroe's 55% of the time. So there is some consistency there. However, why don't we check down here at the uh, at, at number at letter C, right? Consistency between opinion and policy with all proposals in Burstein's sample. So this is all 60 of the policy proposals, and it therefore includes policy proposals where there isn't opinion data. And then things take a turn because we see that the consistency statistic down here is now 31%, and that is substantially different, lending support for the idea that sampling bias is potentially playing a role and that we are even when we're not even with Monroe's not even estimating that much impact of public opinion even then it's potentially overestimated okay so that's enough for this video in class we'll go over some more of the replication efforts and and Bernstein's findings we'll also talk about some of the broader takeaways of this particular chapter thinking about how uh, the, the, uh, the should and the is with respect to public opinion uh, and influence on public policy and how uh, some of these results may or may not reflect how things are democratic or undemocratic and how, uh, you know, the, whether or not there is a you know, mutually exclusive relationship, this dichotomy between public opinion and advocacy as they compete for influence in public policy. We'll also talk about uh, the research done by John Zollick. And we'll talk about how sometimes, often in fact, public opinion on issues doesn't even exist and what this all means. So, uh, can't wait to see you on Zoom on Thursday and uh, get some rest and uh, I will see you then.